This is Writing It, the podcast about academics and writing. I'm Rachel Gordon. Here, we aim to make the process of writing and publishing a bit more transparent and a bit less overwhelming. Through conversations with editors and academics at all stages, from full professors to graduate students, independent scholars, and postdocs, we share stories, lessons, and helpful habits from our writing lives. Today, we're speaking with Margaret Galvin, who is an assistant professor of visual rhetoric in the Department of English at the University of Florida. In her research, she examines how visual culture operates within the print media of feminist and queer social movements of the 1970s to 1990s, recovering artists and their networks. Her first book, Invisible Archives, Queer and Feminist Visual Culture in the 1980s, is coming out very soon this September from University of Minnesota Press's Manifold Scholarship Series. So, Margaret, this is a book with this is a book with a lot of images. Can you tell us how many and whether you think that added to the difficulty of getting this book out? Sure, definitely. So the press was super generous. And when I was first talking with them about this many years ago, they said, how about 75 black and white images? You know, color images are a lot more expensive than they said, you know, even just a few color images, having a color insert can add like $4,000 to the cost of the book. And so 75 black and white sounded good to me. Most of, I have a lot of images that are black and white. Um, also, one of the things is this book is also going to be open access online. And so there is where the, the images can be full color. So there will be a place where people can see the full color versions. Of, I have like one chapter where there's all these um, um, beautiful images. But I think it's you know important, especially if you're going to have a book where you do visual culture, you need a lot of space for a lot of images and different presses will offer different amounts. And it's useful to have that conversation to like ask them, you know, how much do you think or, you know, it, it can be like if they say this, you can say, well, maybe I need that. So they offer me 75. I use 65. Hmm. It may not. I group some of, some of the images are grouped together. So it may seem a little bit less when you're flipping through. But I, I use that amount. That was that's what I needed because I had, you know, multiple things. I'm, I'm analyzing visual materials and you want to be able to see it um, when I've written essays where you can't have any images it really changes what you write about, right? You really can't write about something that you can't, you can't like guarantee that someone will be able to find. I write about a lot of obscure stuff, right? Stuff that's in the archives, it's buried somewhere. So I, it's, it's not something that someone can Google and see an image of if I don't provide the image for them. Um, and so that was really important, but then it makes it more difficult when you're um, securing permissions and things like that. Some presses will be all about fair use, um, some press, presses will require you to have permissions. I also, a lot of my stuff was archivally based, so you need permissions one way or the other for that. And so, you know, I had to get permissions for 65 things. It's not necessarily 65 separate sets of permissions. So that makes it easier because sometimes for 10 images, you're seeking the same set of permissions, right? But also sometimes you are not only getting permissions, but you need to get scans that they think are quality scans. So for some of the things I ended up when I could purchase my own copy of things so I could get my own scan or um, make my own scan of those things. So it does, there are ways in which more images is more labor. And there's ways in which more images not necessarily more labor if a certain cluster of them are all sort of the same set of permissions. But th that same cluster then requires the more labor of all those scans. Right. I wonder what counts as a lot of images. Many historians would like to have some photographs and they might be wondering what is that reasonable range that a regular press might be comfortable with? Yeah, I, I only know anecdotally from my own experience. I mean, 75 sounds like a lot. Sounds like more than most people get in these. I mean, this is also separate from like if you look at a design book where like literally every page has lots of images yeah. and the whole, you know, the images are part of the layout. I'd love to write a book like that someday, you know, but that's that's a whole separate category, mm -hmm. right? So there's ones where like the images are embedded in the design. But when I was talking about presses with my second book, you know, one press was like 100 um, and then one press, I think they were like 25 or 50. Or it was like, really, I felt like it was very low mm -hmm. for the amount that I thought was necessary for the project, especially because I'm doing the research I do with images. You have to see them because I can't guarantee you can find them anywhere else. Mm. Right. But yeah, it seems this seems like a good amount. Like 75 allows me to show you uh, I have five chapters. It allows me to show you 
uh, 10 images or more per chapter. And that gives me a lot of wiggle room in terms of what we can see. And how did you know who to get in touch with about permissions for images? That's variable. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's hard. Um, sometimes a lot of the stuff was independently produced. So I knew I need to find the artist. Um, and I'm working with a lot of comics. So comics is a small world. So there are people I was already in touch with. Some, some, some of the things that made it a little easier is I had sort of two chapters where I had already gotten permissions for articles. So I knew exactly who to get back in touch with about those and those artists. But there are some times where I asked one artist, I thought, maybe you know this person. And she did. And she gave me an email. But then um, there were some artists that I was having difficulty finding. And I was uh, I was like, I ended up putting their names in the New York Times. And I found an article about them in which it mentioned one of their a name of one of their partners. And I Googled this person. I found out he had an email address. And I emailed him and he said, actually, yes, uh, this is me. Mm -hmm. And I am actually still with this person and we still live together. And I know both of these people and I can put you in touch with them. You know, they're still very active artists, but they're not, they're of a older generation. So they're, you know, they don't have, they didn't have a LinkedIn or a Facebook or, you know, social media that I could find very easily and get in touch with them. Um, and so that was, you know, a level of difficulty. But once I found them, they were very generous and open and willing to engage. And so sometimes it takes a little bit about being creative. It's a research process in itself, finding some of these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For you, you were actually dealing with some of the artists themselves who created this image. And so I wonder how the price negotiation worked if there, if you felt you could negotiate. So... A lot of these artists understood that my work is not really commercial. And actually, the press provided a template that explained, this is not a commercial project. Mm. We're not going to be making money off of this. And my work is also rather celebratory. So in some ways, it's bringing their work back into public conversation. So for most of them, uh, they were not requiring permissions for specific images, which made it much easier. Where I did pay a bunch of permissions costs were for scans from archives, or there are certain permissions costs associated with the archives. And so that's something you can't really get around. But with some comics, like some of the materials I acquired myself, and so then if I'm making the scan myself, I'm not, <laughs> you know, having to pay the cost. And then there was, you know, one artist where I was negotiating with the gallery and I was like, okay, well, this is like, you know, the highest level high art artist. And I thought, well, maybe there'll be some permissions costs here. I really don't know what there will be. But luckily, when we finally got, you know, in touch with the artist, finally got everything ironed out, nothing was said about cost. Hmm. For those also scans were made. This person's photographic work is very well known. They just had to like, get the permission and they could just give me the images. But you know, these a lot of my artists are very involved in social activism, I think. So it's it's a different conversation. So it wasn't as expensive as a book with that many images may be otherwise if you're like doing comics but you're working with like DC or Marvel, mm. like mainstream publishers, like the more people who are involved mm. or the, like the more mainstream it is, the bigger the publisher, th they're going to have costs um, and, you know, people involved. And so that wasn't really my situation. Can you tell us about the range of prices you were dealing with? I mean, so for some of this was also from earlier, I think, I remember, I think I paid the Lesbian History Archives like $250. I can't remember mm. exactly a, a while ago for mm -hmm. them to make scans for me, which I was, you know, I'm like donating to a social organization yeah. I really believe in. So I'm like, I'm happy to have them do that. I actually also think I paid someone at the Lesbian History Archive again to make another scan for me um, about $50 or so. It was something that I could find other places. But I was like, well, I know they have a copy of this. You can make a scan for me. That would be great. I think for one of my chapters where there was an executor involved, like so the person was dead mm -hmm. and they have a literary executor, I think it was like $400. Mm. But, you know, this is all off the top of my head. Right. But it really does vary. Um, and so for some of these, uh, based on when they came in, I had some funds I could devote to it, but other of them would have to be out of pocket. So that's also part of the conversation to, you know, these are, you can also apply sometimes for at your university for subvention funds that can mm -hmm. be used for things like this, which can be helpful. But, you know, it really does vary. But luckily, I wasn't hit with a whole bunch of permissions costs. I know I talked to someone and they were saying like, you know, and their work was like on like 
just like early historical 1600s. And I think they were saying their book, the provisions cost were like $6,000. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, luckily not my experience. <laughs> Because yours was such a image rich book, did you know from the start there are only certain presses who can deal with this number of images that I'm looking at? Did it narrow down the presses or make it obvious to you who you wanted to work with? Well, I got lucky in that years and years and years ago, a friend talked to a publisher and the publisher reached directly out to me. Mm. I think this happens sometimes, yeah. you know, so you, you talk to someone and they say, Hey, tell us about your friends who are publishing books and we want to mm-hmm. talk to them. And so it was a good, you know, the offer was generous. And so that was the press I went with, but I've talked to a number of other presses now for a second book project mm-hmm. and just sort of fit, felt them out. And I get the sense, you know, really the range of images they allow varies, but also the thing that varies too is how willing they are to see certain things as fair use, mm-hmm. which would cut down on permissions costs or require permissions no matter what. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my press is more on the, the line of you need to get permissions for everything. Which is not a bad thing because it also got me in contact with some of the artists I hadn't been in contact with before and they were super generous and some of them just sent me a whole bunch of their artwork. Hmm. And so I actually had better versions of things to scan because mm-hmm. then I suddenly had these things I'd only seen in archives before. But yeah, so that's I think that's part of it too is not just how many images, but like where do they fall on the fair use permissions? And so that's different presses are going to be more or less keen to, you know, play ball with you right? Like this really is fair use, Mm -hmm. right? And you can show show that it's fair use because I discuss it and, you know, not going to make money off of it or anything versus this really does require permissions. But some of my stuff was going to require permissions anyway, if I saw it through in archives, Mm -hmm. right? It really falls outside of fair use when it's in an archival collection. Yeah. What are all these images doing to the cost of the book now? I don't know. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> that's my that's my best question. I'm not sure. One of the also the reasons why I chose the press I did is uh, Minnesota is really good about releasing books in paperback right mm. away. They're really good at releasing books at price points that people can afford. Mm-hmm. And so that was one of my considerations to us. I want this book to be one that people could get in their hands and not just by checking out, out of the library. Because as you know, when a book goes over, I think, $50, or even if it's at $50, I'm like, that's something that really only libraries are buying, and you're only buying that if they have a sale sale on the book. So that was one of my considerations, too, is a press that I knew was going to put it in paperback right away and have a price point people could afford. My book ended up being priced at $28. Mm. But I, you know, that was what the cost was, was sort of a surprise (laughs) to me. But I knew, because I know Minnesota... And I know the press that it was going to be in a certain bound, Mm -hmm. right? I have another colleague who has a book coming out that I'm really excited about, but it's $100. Mm. But that, no surprise, because that press, that's the price point that the books come out at. And so those sorts of things you can glimpse very easily by looking at a press's website. Mm -hmm. And you sort of know, you know, what range you're expecting. Mm -hmm. And there's things you can do to lower the permissions cost by getting more subventions and things, or not permissions cost, the book cost, by getting more subventions and things to cover the cost of the labor, which will be more or less doable depending on your field. And also the press will help out with that as well, because there are some subvention things where they have to put an application in themselves. So I did a little bit of that and got some subventions through uh, the university, but there are, I think, other books that they are more interested in getting some subventions for. Um, than mine. You showed me this great spreadsheet you had of kind of uh, book events that you're in the midst of organizing and thinking about organizing. What made you kind of set up this system for yourself? Well, I can never resist a good spreadsheet. I, I'm <laughs> definitely a, someone who thinks in spreadsheets when I was writing my book. I think I had a spreadsheet at least for every chapter where I was there was something that felt beyond me or too big and I felt like I needed a spreadsheet. Mm. And in this case, I felt like I had all these tiny little email threads and I need to like sort of start to account for, you know, when I'm, when I'm recording this podcast, you know, Mm -hmm. what events do I have scheduled? What events do I want to schedule? You know, do I have too many, too little? Um, some of the stuff, you know, um, are, is going to come out of my own. Like if I want to travel there, I'm going to, you know, there's going to be some expense for me. So like, you know, budgeting, right. I wanted to promote the book. 
I wanted to actively promote the book. I've been writing this book for a very long time and I wanted to celebrate the book. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I wanted to find different venues to celebrate it and be very thoughtful. So one of the things I think is super important as well is presses when you're sort of putting your manuscript together and submitting it, submitting a final version is that they will have uh, some sort of level of detailed uh, author questionnaire. And uh, I think those are really important to fill out and to spend a lot of time thinking about. So I'd spend a lot of time thinking about where might I promote this book? Where would I go? You know, the book is about LGBTQ studies, feminist culture. So I wanted to definitely talk in a feminist bookstore. So I'm going to go to Atlanta and talk in Charles Books, which is a long running feminist bookstore there. I wanted to talk to women's gender and sexuality studies departments, especially in this political climate. I wanted to talk to ones in Florida. So uh, hopefully going to be going to be going down to Miami. I wanted to talk to my alma mater. So, you know, um, we have a long running every Friday afternoon. People talk about research at my alma mater, the grad center in New York City. And so I had all these like, I really want to go here and talk about this project. And so, you know, made all those lists and started to email people. Right. And try to get on their on their radar. Right. And ask you know, I'd love to come and give a talk. You know, I, I always remind, remembered when I was a grad student loving when people mm. c- came back who were alums and talked about their book and publishing their book. I had a friend or I have a friend whose book is coming out the same month as mine. So we're at my um, at the grad center. We're both going to talk about our books together, oh, fun. which is a fun way to see someone I haven't seen in a while. And so, you know, all of these strands. And I just wanted to have a spreadsheet so I could organize it all. Also something I could share with my publicist at the press so that, you know, there's times where she needs to come in and like help me with parts of it and she could see what I was working on. So it's a very um, organized way for me to share that information with her of what I've already done, what's in process. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things too, is I have it on a Google Drive. So it's really easy to share that spreadsheet. Um, And to even I can, you know, edit it from my phone right now if I wanted to. And so I thought that was a really useful way to sort of keep my mind around everything and not feel overwhelmed. Yeah. You you mentioned something that you have a publicist at the press. Listeners might be wondering, what have you been able to count on this publicist to do? What What's that relationship like? I mean, I think the more you ask, uh-huh. the more you can have them do. You know, the squeaky wheel yeah. gets the grease or whatever. You know, I, there's also a social media person I've been working with as well. And so, you know, the, the press prepares like here's our guide of what we're going to do. Right. And uh, here's our social media strategies. But like, for instance, I had seen one of my friends had when they when their book was being released, they had on like their Twitter, (laughs) RIP Twitter (laughs) um, and their Facebook. They had these really beautiful banners. Mm. And so I sent that to my social media person at the press and I said, hey, can we make can you make one of these for me? Mm. Right. You guys have graphic design people. Can you make one? Mm. And so they did. Mm. Um, and so I have those uploaded, but that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't asked. And so, you know, with the publicist, sometimes I'm also just asking sort of silly questions like, you know, this is my first book, right? So I don't know everything. So when you say this, what do you mean? Like, so they have like a small, small budget for like promotion, right? And I'm like, so what does that mean? What can we do? And they said, well, you know, if there's a case where you're traveling somewhere and you need more funds to travel somewhere, we could have it do that. Mm. Or if there's a place where, you know, some place requires you to pay to speak at this venue, we could have it do that. So like it's, but I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't asked the stupid question, (laughs) what does this do? Or I don't know. It's just like, I think the more you ask, the more they will do and the more that they will see that you are, you are one of those people Mm -hmm. who wants to be active in promoting your book um, and they'll take a role in that. So like uh, one of the things they were telling me is like, well, if you want to do another event while you're in New York, I have a good relationship with this bookstore. Mm. And so I can get in contact with them. Mm -hmm. And so they would take some of that and share some of that labor rather than me having to send out that email. And so I think it's just sort of developing, developing a rapport with them and also getting a sense of uh, what are they doing? What do you need to be doing? How do you divide those things? They're definitely, they're the ones who are often contacting journals, sending out review copies, things like that. But if you have specific journals where you want review copies to go, or you know people who will review for a specific journal, I don't, they're not going to know that. Mm -hmm. And they'll also have, you know, all the things they know just in general, but they don't know your field like you know your field. And so I think it's important to have those conversations with your publicist about that Mm -hmm. Um, and to be on their radar because they are probably, you know, (laughs) like so many things, probably understaffed. Mm -hmm. 
Um, they probably have more books that they're working on, a lot more, right? So you need to identify yourself as someone who wants to be active in working with them on this so that not that they're doing the bare minimum, but they have the things they're going to do and they have the things that they won't do unless you sort of collaborate with them on it or they know that's important to you to do these things. Right. And of course, we're not saying here that one should or is supposed to be book promoting. But but Margaret, as you were saying, if you are an author who wants to be doing those kinds of things, actually talking and asking questions with your people at the press, you know, facilitates more action on their part. Speaking of of maybe dumb questions, but the the banner thing, is that also that type of thing that could go on somebody's email? So your outgoing email might have that banner they created? I guess so. I'm not sure. I didn't put an image in my email, but I did put a line in my email that said, mm-hmm. hey, my book is coming out this fall. Um, and that was, was one something, one of the things in their sort of promo guide. The thing I liked about their promotion guide they sent out, sort of their general one, is they sort of gave suggestions for people at sort of all levels of, you know, willingness to engage or all levels of, you know, like I'm really active online and already have a dedicated media presence versus, you know, I, I really don't want anyone to know that I exist on the internet. <laughs> so I, I think one of the things that was also key is they were saying things like, well, you know, if you don't already have a lot of social media, this is not necessarily time to go like create a presence online, unless you're someone who's, you're going to create a presence online and people are going to immediately follow you, mm-hmm. but like build from what you already have. Yeah. And so when I was talking with like the social media person who's separate from the publicist, right? Like I was showing them, I'm like, I'm like, okay, well, so this thing got this many retweets and I was thinking of doing this tweet. What do you think? And and she was very supportive and she said, these sound all like really great ideas. Mm-hmm. And so like I did like this summer, I did a post where I said, hey, here's the books in LGBTQ studies that I'm excited about that are coming mm-hmm. out soon. So I did a lot of work where... You know, I knew some people with books coming out. I mm-hmm. want to promote them. I want to also promote my book, but yeah. put it like in sort of a larger conversation. And so I went and I grabbed all those book covers. Nice. And then I created a post on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook with all of these things. And so then that sort of was a way for me to promote my book, but also promote the field, promote all these other beautiful books during Pride Month, of course. Mm. So that's one of the things, too, I'm thinking about is like, when are these big moments where you want to be promoting something because it's like, you know, October is LGBTQ History Month, I believe. We have National Coming Out Day coming out. We have World AIDS Day. I have some content in my book about HIV and AIDS. There's Bisexual Visibility Day. I have a lot of bisexual content in my book as well. And so it's just being aware of these things sort of coming up and how they might sort of connect to what you're what you're doing. Mm-hmm. It was also great that your your editor or publicity person had mentioned they they knew how they had a bookstore contact for you. It in your experience, can you as an author approach a bookstore and suggest, oh, this would be a great community, or I've I love this bookstore, I'd love to have a, a book event here. How does that kind of cold call with a, a bookstore work? Well, I did approach Charis Books in Atlanta sort of cold, but mm-hmm. I knew someone had done an event there. And so I asked her, who do I talk to? Ah, okay. So some of this is also like being aware of and like, as I have friends who have books coming out, like taking notes of mm-hmm. my own of what they're doing or asking them what they're doing. And then sort of building off the work other people are doing and not try to reinvent the wheel. And one of the things my publicist also mentioned, too, is think about where you're likely to have an audience. Mm. So you don't want to go to a bookstore in a town where you don't know anyone, Mm -hmm. right? Especially, I think, for bookstores, thinking about places where you might have the capacity for a local audience is really key. Maybe less so with universities because you might, like, if you connect to a center or something, you know, professors can bring their students from their classes if you have if you're talking about something that's relevant to subject matter at the university and they'll bring their students to be audience for your talk but especially at a bookstore you need to think about this bookstore isn't a place where I can sort of get people to come yeah. out and want to come to this event mm. so if you've got family and friends yeah. in a town for instance at least you know there's going to be a not too embarrassing size crowd there. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to have the bookstore event where no one attends. But sort of thinking about, you know, all of these events, I have a bunch, not a bunch, well, a few, a good, a good, yeah. a good amount um, for this fall, thinking of them all as sort of launch events and not one as primary over the other, because they're all different groups of people, right? Um, and thinking about them all as events that are launching this conversation that then hopefully, you know, you know, there'll be more coming and people will invite and be excited to hear me talk about this book, which has been, 
you know, so long in, in being produced. I've been working on this for, you know, a decade now. Yeah. Another topic that's kind of book related, although it has more to do with what, with a book that's coming up are these fellowships that we academics often apply for while we're working on or wrapping up book one, but that are actually for book two. Um, and you did one of these wonderful fellowships at Stanford a year or two ago. How was it applying for that and being in that mindset while you were still in book one? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, for me, for so many years, I've been writing past the first book. <laughs> I'm writing, finishing the first book. The first book is a revision of my dissertation, but I've also been working on other things in ways that also helped me figure out my my voice that I wanted in the first book and what I wanted the first book to do and accomplish. Um, and so I had been sort of working on all these things. And so this gave me a, a minute to sort of think about how all these things maybe would coalesce, coalesce into a second book project. And so I had a friend who said, well, you know, these fellowships, they take, you know, years <laughs> to get. So you should just start applying now. You might not get it now. Somehow I got very lucky. Someone liked what I was doing and they said, hey, <laughs> would you like this fellowship? And I said, yes, I would love this fellowship. And so got to spend a year in um, the Bay Area. My second book project is on like LGBTQ uh, comics artists and how they form community through comics and through these small comics that appear, you know, in news newspapers, like gay and lesbian newspapers that appear like on protest posters that do things like fundraise for HIV AIDS research, which is really big in this time. That document, um, what it means to be a gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans person at this moment, which at a moment in the 80s and 90s where you're not necessarily getting a lot of mainstream representation and does it in a way in cartoons where you're not necessarily you can speak to someone's real experience, but not necessarily outing someone. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it's mm -hmm. not it can be documentary and someone's real life, but not also then showing <laughs> someone someone real if you want to be sort of um, covert in that way. Um, and so going to San Francisco and doing that work, I, I was able to spend a lot of time in new collections. I do love mm -hmm. archival research. Uh, the, the Bay Area is known for LGBTQ history. It's also known for being a hub of um, comics community and comics history. So it's a really lovely place to be out there. And, you know, I had submitted the book manuscript and was waiting on peer review. And so what else do you have to do at that yeah. point but to work on a second project? And so it was nice then when the book came back when I got the peer review reports, I was sort of in this very writerly mindset working on this other project, but I could take that energy and then apply it to getting this project finished mm -hmm. and to, you know, making that introduction sing mm -hmm. to making sure I answered all the peer reviewer notes and, and got it sort of very strong. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was kind of at the perfect time. Yeah, I think so. It was great. Yeah. And is the second book going to be also a very image rich kind of book? Yeah, definitely. So that's something, you know, no matter what press I end up working with, I will want images because a lot of the things I want to talk about are things that are no longer in circulation and they're hard to get. So I see them in archives or I've been also building my own collection of comics, rare comics through like emailing people and getting people send me their comics in the 90s or mm -hmm. finding have a lot of eBay keyword searches up and buying them when I can afford them. And so a lot of this this material is is very rare. And so whenever I teach this area, because it's a very rich area, I'm always bringing these books in for my students to see. So in those cases, you really need the images because people can't access it. Mm -hmm. They really can't find it on their own. And so also the book is in some ways like a reclamation or a, re a small republishing of some of this work as well. Yeah, that sounds great. We're asking all of our guests two questions. One is, what is something that you wish you had known about writing or publishing earlier in your academic career? I mean, so many things. But <laughs> one thing um, in terms of the book project is, you know, there's times when, you know, you can take your time. And then there's times when you need to sort of be on the press's clock. So when you're doing your own revisions and preparing it for peer review, it can take as long as it wants. And the book is just going to come out when it comes out. When it starts to get into that process, mm. you need to be like, there are deadlines you need to meet. And there's some wiggle room, right? Mm -hmm. But you need to sort of all all hands on ship, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and getting things done. And some things are going to take a lot longer, especially if you've never done them before. So I had someone, a friend I paid for indexing. Mm -hmm. But then when they index, I found I really wanted to also go through that index mm -hmm. and build on it more. And mm -hmm. that took 
such a long time. So indexing took forever and a day. And it was so I was like, need to get this done. But I was like, hey, partner, come and help me check these things Mm. so we can get this done. And so that was one of the things where I was like, I don't have enough hands for this. I need (laughs) to ask my significant other. They can help me a little bit with this indexing because it really, really, really needed to get in. Mm -hmm. Um, And was one of sort of the the things we're trying to get to the final proofs. Um, And so that was one of the things It takes a lot of time, especially when it starts to go into production. And when it goes into production, you really don't want to be off of their timeline Mm -hmm. or, you know, you can ask for a little extra time, but you really don't want to be because it then can push the publication date. Yeah. How did you find that with copy editing? What was the turnaround like for you in there? I mean, I think they were always very generous, but some of the things took more time than I thought they were going to take or you know, you're also teaching at the same Mm -hmm. time and or you get in there and you really want to spend more time with it. I mean, I think also I'm someone who's very detail oriented. So as I understood it, I sent them a cleaner copy than they're used to seeing. Um, So perhaps the copy editing process wasn't as onerous as Mm. it would have been with other folks. But the indexing, you know, Uh indexing is just going to be insane for for anyone, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And so the copy editing was not something I remember pulling my hair out about (laughs) yeah and that reminds me another friend mentioned the acknowledgements they're like oh wait this is the thing that really matters in a way because it's all about you know your relationships and actually getting to express that if you want to or need to express that um and so in a way that that they were saying it might have been good to to start this early because it actually is can be something that sort of matters to you the most in a way Yeah, I spent a a long time drafting my acknowledgments and thinking where people belonged. And I wanted to make sure I got everyone's name in there. The one thing about acknowledgments is that's something that you can continue to edit for longer Mm -hmm. and continue to add. Even when you're like final proofs, Mm -hmm. you can still like, if you know, especially for me, I'm like, well, there's new people I'm working with at the press, I haven't thanked yet. So I want to like, get those people's names in there or I did a lot of searching in my email to get dates for things Mm. to remember when did I do this one thing or someone invited me Mm -hmm. for a talk. Who was it that invited me? I want to thank them because I was super key. And so I spent a lot of time doing that. And I I wrote a long acknowledgement. So I went at the end of the book, (laughs) which is where they put the long ones, which is why you can continue to edit it towards the end because it's not changing the pagination of anything else. Um, And so that was one thing that sort of took a little bit of pressure off that I knew if there was someone's name I had forgotten. But then I remembered it later. There would be a space for me to fix that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, I spent a long time on acknowledgments too. So I think for me, they were really important to name specific people mm-hmm. and a lot of people because yeah. a lot of people helped out. Another question we're asking is if there is a writing practice or habit that's been working for you. I mean, I think one thing is finding ways to try to stay in the writing process on a regular basis. I do have a weekly standing weekly meeting where I meet with friends, we get coffee, and we work on whatever we're working on. And my friends are um, artists of various types, Mm -hmm. ones like a teacher. And so sometimes, you know, they're working on things for their classroom or things like that. And I always just try to even when I'm very busy with my teaching, I always try to make sure to bring something that's a writing thing I'm working Mm -hmm. on to that meeting. And so, you know, those times trying to schedule times in where I can be working on that. And that's, that's one of the ones I've been doing for a while, but I, I always find those to be very useful. I also have a long um, standing writing group where we meet every once in a while on Zoom. Well, we're friends from grad school. We all work with the same dissertation advisor. And we will also sometimes be like, hey, I need someone to look at this letter, you know, something small. Or mm-hmm. we've done things where like, we need to like work on our abstracts for a conference and we'll just like, you know, workshop those together in Mm -hmm. a meeting. And so having those sort of longstanding relationships have been so key Mm. um, to keeping things going to have, you know, you have readers, right, who understand what it is you're working on, who know your work inside and out. And those things take a long time to develop. Yeah, it it made me think, I feel like I had a few more of those during the pandemic because we were all so Zoom in shape, but it it might be worth trying to revive even for sort of a one-off, like you're saying, uh, like, let's workshop something or can we all take a look at something together? That that sounds fun. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us about this first book experience or the um, image and permissions process in particular? I mean, I think it's just been it's been so much fun <laughs> making the book finally come alive. And also, you know, sometimes you get 
like in your head and you're not like you've been working on it so long that you're tired with Mm -hmm. it. And so Mm -hmm. I think it's also like there's something beautiful about sharing with other people to see their excitement about the project, Mm. right? Like, because for them, it's all new. For Mm. them, like, Santa Claus is still alive and you're this jaded (laughs) adult who knows that Santa Claus is dead, right? Um, (laughs) But, you know, for them, it's, like, new and this project is new and it's Mm. very exciting. Um, And so I think that's one of the things is to get excited about it again and to find ways, find those people who are thrilled about your work who are your readers right you know sometimes people are like oh we're you know we're just academics who's this is a very small readership blah 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 blah. i'm like no Mm -hmm. i know there's people who are excited about my work there's people who you know you go to conferences and they ask you excited questions like where do those people coalesce like i one of my events i'm doing is a virtual event for this like group of cartoonists and interested people who are interested in cartoons and they sort of just do a series of talks. And I knew Ooh. I knew about this for years. I've gone to these talks like years and years and years ago. And so, you know, I've just been collecting these ideas um, over the years. And then now is the time where I can reach out and say like, hey, <laughs> I'd love to talk about this. This book is coming out. Um, and so finding those groups of people and they do exist, um, mm-hmm. even if your book is very or rather niche. There are weirdos everywhere who want to read your work. And so I think for me, promoting is also getting back in touch with that excitement. I mean, I'm excited Mm -hmm. about the book, Mm -hmm. but like getting in touch with like what's exciting about it for other people. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that does sound fun actually now that you mentioned just trying to even discover, you know, which almost forgotten groups actually might want to have a book event or hear about this book or just get sent an email that it's coming out soon. Yeah, 100%. So thank you very much, Margaret, for spending time with us. Really appreciate talking to you today and looking forward to your book. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure. I'm excited um, to have it out in the world. So it was great to talk about the process because we don't get to talk about the process enough. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Writing It, the podcast about academics and writing sponsored by the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Florida. Visit our podcast description to find out how to contact us and send us your questions about academic writing and publishing. Follow us on social media at Writing It Pod and subscribe to us so you never miss an episode.